everyone, my name is Spruti and today I'm going to be doing a presentation about the research we're doing to improve model and retrieval accuracy for question answering uh, tasks on financial documents. So a bit of background on myself, I've been working um, with Anna for a little over a year now with a lot of the machine learning research and working with the team over the summer. And this presentation is sort of a presentation of the culmination of a lot of the research we were we were doing over the past few months. So to get started, oops. To get started, let's talk about why exactly this research has existed. So everyone here is definitely familiar with uh, the generative AI that is already out there, like ChatGPT, and it has been really great for product for our productivity, but however, they generally have the best performance on very general tasks and queries. And this is generally because that the way these large language models work and then the way that they are trained is on a very domain agnostic uh, text of data so that there may be very good for general chatbot, uh, chatbot type tasks. But however, if you wanted to get very specific, for example, if you are a final financial analyst and you want to make some sort of uh, questions or annotations on like earning calls that require very complex uh, reasoning and domain specific knowledge, they perform very, very, very poorly. And if it cannot find the exact, um, the exact information that they that they need, it is very prone to hallucinations. So this is sort of like an example where um, a general, you know, chop up one from like Meta or OpenAI may give a answer that is seemingly believable. However, the actual answer is very, uh, is very much off. And this is very dangerous, especially with, you know, applications in finance and legal to for these models to have a very believable answer that is completely off that could have serious uh, business ramifications. So here at Anna, we really, and the research we owned was really trying to make these models better. How do we make them more accurate so that people can actually use them for these more complex use cases? So these are the three general buckets where they can do it. We kind of do a combination of a few of these different methods in order to improve these models. So you probably heard of prompt engineering, which you probably do every day if you like interact with GPT or chat GPT and similar models, which is basically like even the same question asked a different way can lead to better answers. And then also some more technical options of how to improve your model is one is called retrieval augmented generation and fine tuning, which will sort of be the focus of the talk today. So First, I'm going to go through um, the first paper we did, which is focused on uh, fine tuning in order to enhance large language model performances. So the abstract of these is similar to, as I was saying before, the effectiveness of these LLMs is very suboptimal when for a highly complex, uh, highly complex and domain specific task types. How, and because of this, they're not very effective and can't really, really be used. So in order to address these challenges, we took a fine tuning approach on a domain specific data set in order to see if we could improve these models and also combining that with the RAG approach. This is a quick overview of the data sets that we used. So Finance Bench was this data set, which essentially was created by having a bunch of like human human experts go in and annotate a lot of these like 10Ks and like uh and answer a bunch of metrics and finance related questions. And what was really nice about this data set was not only did they give the question and the answer, but since it was based off the document, they actually uh, gave the excerpt of the document, which the answer was found and the link to the 10k, which it was so we could try to fine tune our models in order to emulate that. And the similar data set was a uh, rag, uh, rag and struct were similarly in uh, these required some calculations and domain specific expertise to be done and had the query, the answer, as well as the context from the actual document where it was taken from. 
Now, before I go into like the technical details of how fine tuning works, let's talk about what it is and why you should do it. So these, when you, before you fine tune, most large language models go through this process called pre-training, which they're trained on this huge corpus of like text data. You can think of like a, like a bunch of Wikipedia articles or like books, which is kind of allowing the model to gain like know how to make coherent sentences but it's completely domain agnostic if you wanted to have a highly specialized model that behaved in a very specific way or had very specific domain uh do domain knowledge this is where fine tuning would come in and this is when you're actually updating the weights of the model in order to have this have this use case and because you're updating it via specifically if you do supervised fine tuning with when you have the inputs and outputs, you could have the model behavior in a more exact way, which you which you would like. Here you can see an example where you would fine tune it to be like a chatbot, uh, like a chatbot use case. Similarly, maybe we can try to fine tune it for answering questions on financial documents. As I was saying, these are the three main ways of doing the fine tuning. Uh, self supervised is very similar to unsupervised learning. You'll hear a talk. Um, from Ben tomorrow about more details about that. And um, reinforcement learning is a way where you can actually have a reward function that maybe is powered by like the human feedback. Um, but if, for the purposes of this paper, we mostly focus it on supervised uh, fine tuning or learning where we give the models both inputs and outputs as you saw with the data sets that I showed. As I was saying before, with the pre-training, you may have heard me say where this is what's done with like the large corpus of data sets. And then those data sets I showed in more detail with Finance Bench and Rag and Strike, this is where the domain specific data set comes in on that we use to fine tune on top of the pre-trained one. And this is where we get the specialized LLM that the user can uh, interact with directly. And within supervised fine tuning specifically, you can have full fine tuning, which is updating all the weights. However, this is very computationally expensive and you can run the risk of for forgetting a lot of it. Or you can do another thing called transfer learning, but this is still quite expensive. So the method that we use was something called parameter efficient fine tuning. And the way that you do this is that you freeze all the existing weights and then only augment the ones that you want to update. And then this is much more um, much more efficient. And you can see this graphic sort of explained it, where maybe the original LLM will be represented by this box. And then if you want to uh, update it, you add some additional parameters like this and only update those using your domain-specific data set. So this technique called LoRa is a way to even further uh, optimize the fine tuning process. So we already optimize it by adding weights instead of updating all the weights. LoRa is a way of using low rank matrices so that instead of uh, maybe traditionally you would have like a hundred weights, a uh, hundred weights represented by a matrix to update. The way that LoRa works is that it uses matrix multiplication. So you maybe only have to update two uh, 10 by 1 and 1 by 10 matrices, so you're updating a lot uh, a lot less weights to make it even less computationally expensive and requiring a lot less memory. And to make it even more efficient, if you have access to GPUs, you can do something called QLoRa, which is undergoes a process called quantization, which reduces maybe if something, the weights, which are basically just numbers for each of the nodes, if it's stored in to like a higher complexity, like 16 bits, you can reduce that to be a four bit or an eight bit. And this will significantly reduce the memory uh, required and makes it more computationally efficient. And the reason why um, the paper released on this sort of found that even though like you're making these individual like net nodes less precise overall in the fine tuning process, it doesn't lead to that much of a difference um, in the model performance. So uh, let's go to the actual um, uh, uh, results of, on the fi on the finance bench. So this is um, the initial uh, question of like where um, uh, that it asked about a very technical question, and the correct answer is 
1577 million. And as you could see, um, before fine tuning, it was incorrect, but after fine tuning, it had that um, correct answer. Um, and then you could see uh, uh, initially here that with these um, different uh, different evaluation metrics, um, cosine similarity is a way of is a way of and rho gal score are like sort of two different ways to um, evaluate how similar two two strings are. However, they kind of use very like static metrics that. Um, don't really capture the semantic meaning of the text. And this is would be, you would mostly use it for if you were to um, combine something like, co compare something like the ground truth answer versus the model prediction. But even though two things may not have share a lot of the words, they may have like the same semantic answer. And those two metrics don't really capture that, which is why it's really good to have some sort of thing um, with human, uh, with human eva ev evaluation in it. And however, there's a trade-off between this, between reliability and scalability, while, um, you know, cosine similarity and rogue out may be more scalable, they're probably not as reliable as like human eval. Um, and then these are kind of briefly the results of the paper. So Anno is mostly a, a data labeling platform. So what we kind of, uh, we did in the paper was that we fine tune on different numbers of of labels and we wanted to see if the models um if the models would improve with different numbers of labels so and as you can see we sort of did achieve this with um gbt 3.5 like uh specifically like the more labels that we did we had a significantly higher accuracy uh significantly higher accuracy than uh than before however like as i mentioned like one limitation was this of this was like the difference of like um eva evaluation uh, metrics so you know in uh, in in the future it would be interesting to see if some sort of like if you were to scale like human accuracy uh the difference in evaluation metrics for the different number of labels and we kind of took that and went into like the next research we did because some of the key um some of the uh some of the key limitations of the first paper that we realized was that hey even though well one was that cosine similarity and human e and and rogal were not good metrics and then it's not really feasible to ask a person to um uh, to ask a person to sort of like manually evaluate each one and another one we realized was that not only is it important to improve the actual model itself but especially for document-based question answering the piece which is retrieved is very important and that is kind of what the the second research initiative that we did was that was actually trying to improve the model's performance. This is, we're going to try to improve the retrieval portion and I'll go get into more details of what that means in the contents of RAG. So the premise of this paper was that while we kind of established that the general performance of these models isn't great and we kind of walked through like in technical terms of how we can like fine tune it to improve these models however the way that these models work is that especially for document based question answering it's fed in an input from uh from the text and the effectiveness of how accurate that model can answer is largely dependent on the input of this text but what we've uh realized um in like our previous work is that when we kind of like leave these models to like ex um, get the aspect from the text itself, they kind of like always get the wrong aspect and which is why they would consistently answer it wrong. So while our results showed it with the given context of the data set, that really doesn't representative of how you would use it in real life. So in order to address this in this work, we try to employ a bunch of different techniques to see how we can improve the model's ability to actually get the right um, portion from the text. So now I'll explain more in detail to what exactly RAG is. I've probably been um, throwing around this term a lot, but it's good to actually explain the architecture of how it works. And I guess intuitively, if if you've ever used like a chatbot and for example, like if you ask a question like, 
what is the capital of France? It kind of like knows it through its inherent knowledge that it might be Paris. But if maybe in some cases you have like, um, there, there's like certain context that the LLM would need to answer the question. So like, for example, when I, when I need this, I generally just copy and paste that directly uh, in, into the prompt. I'd be like, hey, like, can you answer this question about this certain passage? And then I paste the passage. So this is fine when you have like a couple hundred words, it's not that long of a document, but instead, if you want to answer questions where the context is like, uh, you know, a 50 or 100 page docs or several of those documents, this is when you need something called uh, retrieval augmented generation. So the way that it takes is that um, we store in something called a knowledge hub, uh, which is basically all your domain specific knowledge. So if I want to answer questions on like a bunch of earnings calls, we would take all those earnings calls, we would convert them into um, embeddings, store them in a vector database, and then we would convert the query into embeddings. And then find by doing a similarity search, we would compare which section from this document is the most similar or the most relevant to answer those documents. And then it would append, this is where the augmentation part comes before prompting the LLM. So maybe we would have a prompt, your financial chatbot answer, it, like this is the question, answer using this context. And that context would be retrieved from the several from the several docs. And because you're giving the information right there, it is very effective in preventing halluc uh, hallucinations. So this is, that was kind of uh, how it works. And generally the similarity we search is use something with cosine similarity, which kind of looks for a lot of like similar, um, similar words with similar meanings. But as we sort of like found with our, um, with our work when we were trying to do like RAG uh, previously, the the chunk that a human would find, like a human expert would know where to look in the document and the, the section to find, that's very different than maybe what a basic RAG pipeline would find. And even the best models, even after you do fine tuning, ultimately, if you're not given the right um, input, it can't answer the question properly. So which is why we've kind of tried to, uh, a, these are several different um, techniques, which we tested out to see if they would actually improve retrieval. And I'll go through them each to explain how they work. So this is more about in the details about the limitations of current RAG. So as I explained, right now RAG uses something called cosine similarity, but this does not necessarily indicate relevance. Maybe a human expert would know if I'm asking for this metric, then I would need to go through this section of the of the document. However, the model is just used looking for ones with the most similar words, and those might not always correspond. Another thing is a lot of RAG ones do not chunk the document properly for different types of documents. Maybe you need different uh, sizes of context and it kind of disregards the structure of the document. And this is even more so apparent if maybe you don't need one chunk, but you need multiple chunks that are located in different parts. Current pipelines don't know how to solve that. And in addition to like, uh, similar to in the fine tuning uh, problems that we see, there's a lack of domain specific knowledge. So this is the chunking strategies things that uh, that we tried out. So before there would be a lot of uniform chunking that it would be a hard coded amount of say 100 or 200 characters or like words. And then it would break the document up into that. However, this may lead to like some being like been cut off mid sentence or it not really making uh, making sense and because it's not dynamic it's very difficult for example if you set it too big you risk a lot of irrelevant um, information being in and if you make it um, too small you risk not enough information so we improved it with recursive checking that um, takes in more natural language processing techniques to um, know things about like, oh, a sentence or this thought ends here, or this is the start of a new a paragraph to kind of keep that in mind. And also, especially with documents, like a lot of these are maybe PDF format that have different headings and things. So knowing like once a new section started that this is a new chunk, uh, et cetera, for more element-based chunking that really accounts for the document structure. 
So this is another aspect which not maybe the important information is not only in the text itself, but in the metadata about said text. So maybe we can annotate um, like the document. Maybe we have the a bunch of documents of the same company, but from multiple different years or the same maybe earnings call, but for multiple different like companies, maybe that's not always like apparent in the raw text of it because it could look, you know, very similar for two different things, but it's actually in two completely different contexts. So this is why we would want to do something like um, annotation. So maybe you could filter it so that in the pipeline, if you ask it about this company, it knows how to filter it which doc and within where in the doc to uh to to find it to sort of like enhance that rack pipeline and in the future we're, we're gonna uh we're trying to integrate this with you know, it's like data labeling platform that already has the idea to um to annotate your documents and then also integrate that to enhance the accuracy of retrieving when you want to answer answer questions based on them so this is another um method more of like a zero shot method where with no additional data or fine tuning, we can sort of like improve it, which is called query expansion. So standard is kind of showing how like a traditional RAP pipeline would work where only the question is used to find relevant docs and get the results. However, there is a specific um, method called hypothetical document embeddings and um, the these researchers essentially what they did is that um, they initially they asked the question and before even retrieving the document, they um, prompted the LLM with just the raw question and the LLM would give them an answer, which would definitely be wrong because it doesn't have any context to, um, to re retrieve it. And it would take the combination of the answer plus the original query and use that to search the docs. And the idea is that this fake answer that you use maybe has some additional clues or phrases or words that will help us doing the similarity search to get the most um, the most relevant embeddings to actually do the retrieval aspect. And this is another zero shot method called re-ranking. And this sort of goes to address the shortcoming that similarity is not e always equal to relevance. So maybe initially we'll have like cosine similarity have like some sort of ranking, but maybe it just because it has the most similar words doesn't necessarily mean it is like the most relevant. So maybe we can go in with another machine learning uh, algorithm or uh, or something to give the scores again with like given this question how relevant is this is this document and you can see it may be like um it, it can move move them around so maybe the fourth or fifth most similar chunk is actually the most relevant chunk or or something similar and in this um uh, paper specifically um, use a cross encoder model, which is kind of pretty good at taking like two different inputs and scoring how like relevant um, they are like compared compared to each other. So we use that in order to re rank um, the different chunks. And then this is um, more um, this is a more like advanced techniques to um, to improve retrieval and. Uh, I'll explain what this means, which is fine tuning embedding models. So an embedding model is essentially what converts words into like numerical representations so that the model could actually understand them. And this is really important because the entire basis of how it finds um, the retrieved aspect with similarity search or whatever, it needs to be um, in numbers first. And there's a lot of like, pretty good embeddings out, um, uh, already already pre-trained and out there. However, similar to like what we were saying about the models before, they're domain agnostic. So maybe they'll just kind of put um, words with like similar uh, sentences with just like similar words um, like similar in, in, in the space. However, that may not mean they're like semantically, that they're like semantically similar. So this is kind of like showing how like before and after fine tuning can change how like these sentences or maybe these chunks, these texts are represented differently within the vector space. 
um, we are trying to do that similarly, but with like domain specific knowledge. So maybe you can, in like general um, English, um, a lot of words pertaining to like finance may kind of all be like clustered together because the model um, thinks that they're like pretty close together in like the grand scheme of everything. But if you want to make it more domain specific, it can better capture like the differences and the nuance between uh, different uh, different terms. So now going into like the actual like evaluation, um, Hirsch will also be giving a presentation about evaluation where he'll go more in depth, but there's two aspects of it. One is actually did the model uh, retrieve the right um, uh, piece, uh, piece of the text fr from the document? And this is actually not evaluating um, the LLM itself, but whatever pipeline, whatever algorithm you use to like retrieve uh, retrieve this. And then also it is, this is kind of um, what is more so of the focus of how well did the model actually answer uh, answer the questions. And as like before, her, uh, we only use something like Rogel and cosine similarity. But in addition to that, we added something like LLM eval to sort of substitute um, the, the, the human uh, eva evaluation with the evaluation prompt so that we would be able to get a better capture of the accuracy without having to put a large amount of manual effort. And these are sort of like the results that you could, um, that you uh, would see. You can see like the base rack is without any like sort of like improvements or enhancements, which is like, uh, I'll be focusing on like on the bottom, uh, sorry, in like, um, the, the top and bottom are cosine similarity and then query expansion. Um, and then the middle is sort of like the LLM eval. So you can see the worst performing one is the base one, which is with no additional improvements. And the, the highest performing one is something I called fake rag, which is essentially that we already, we use a lot of the same data sets as the previous research. And those data sets had like, um had the had the accurate context um in uh, in it so we we fed the model the question and the correct context and so we were purely testing how the model performed um not because we had already accounted for the retrieval aspect and then these the these two methods query expansion and like re-ranker are also are also there so you can see like specifically for like LLM eval, the the query expansion and like the re-ranker, they they're not as good as like the the fake rag, but they're a lot they're a lot closer than like the base rag cases. So it kind of um it uh it kind of and there's also like question a question of like accounting understanding the different trade-offs between the different evaluation. But generally, um employing these methods did not do um, as well as the best case scenario, but it did better than like the the than the starting point, which we can kind of take as like we can sort of like employ these techniques um, in addition to like general fine tuning techniques to get higher accuracy. And another thing to know is that while well, fake um the best case scenario still had like pretty pretty good accuracy. It's um it's for a lot of these use cases we want that to be like even higher. So that'll be like something of like on ongoing of of like try to do is that even though we get the we get an accurate chunk, we want the models to have even more like domain specific knowledge to get like as optimal results as possible. But that sort of like concludes the talk. Um uh, it was pretty, uh, pretty like technical, but I hope I was able to break it down enough. These are our upcoming talks. I highly recommend um, you join, and we'll sort of be uh, presenting the work of like the the rest of the summer team as well. Um, so thank you guys for for joining, and I'll take any questions if anyone has any. Thanks. Thanks so much, Sperthy. Um, thanks so much, Sperthy. I think this is a really incredible talk. Um, 
I learned a lot from this talk. So I just wanted to thank you. Maybe it'd be cool. Just like the remaining time, we can maybe go through the two papers and like the blog post just so we can um, see like what those are like. Um, uh, so Okay, um, so what Natan is showing now is like sort of what we put out as a result. So we made like a blog post that um, kind of like summarizes uh, what the paper in like uh, was about and tries to like explain um, the work we did and like all these technical concepts in a more digestible way. And it's also um, linked to the um to like the github and it's public github repo where all of our code is there and then um the paper on uh arcsiv with uh with everything but if you're interested in um reading more about it about or like referencing um then you can you can take a look yeah so most of this stuff is within like benchmarking uh, within is within like benchmarking rag and not all of like the thing you can look at more um more of the code within here not everything that was like within um the results section so like the query because of like um some constraints the chunking uh didn't get on the whole data set, which is why it wasn't compared. But you can, we tested out a bunch of different like chunking strategies, including like semantic chunking, agentic chunking, um, and a bunch of different uh di different things. So if you're um if you're interested in taking a look, um uh you you could do uh you could do that. And then this is um a more like a very much like in-depth explanation of like everything. Um, yeah. Yeah. So thank you for being so. All right. Um, I think if there's, um, nothing else, uh, we can conclude the call. Uh, I want to say thank you to everyone who joined, um, and I hope you learned something uh, from the from the presentation and definitely register and attend to the rest of um, the events uh, throughout the week. Um, the team this summer did a great job and um, they're going to be yeah showing some pretty cool stuff. <laughs>